Tamang kaalaman tungo sa malayang kaisipan. Ako po si Ferdy Isleta. Ang kultura ay susi sa kadakilaan. Ako po si Annie Louise. Isang oras ng ang kailangan. Ako po si Renena Peñas. At ito ang Padayon Presents the NCCA Hour. Sulong na! Dayon, the NCCA Hour. Sulong na. Darling. 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 Yes, darling. Darling. Sa ilalim ng kanyang bantog ng pangalan at sa gisag panulat na Quijano de Manila, yung Quijano, nandun lahat ng letters ng Joaquin, ay nailathala ang mga iba't ibang klasikong kayamanan ng Filipinong panitikan na ang mga tema at mensahe ay nananatiling napapanahon Lumipas pan ang maraming taon, kinilala siya bilang isa sa mga pinakamahusay at pinakamahalagang nobelista, mananaysay, makata, mandudula at periodista. Hindi lamang ng kanyang panahon, pagkus hanggang sa kasalukuyan. Malalim ang pagmamahal niya. Tunay katao. Consummate. Idol. Dakilang tao. Is a genius. Itinaturing buhon at higante ng panitikang Pilipino. Ating pasukin ang makulay na mundo ng puno ng imahinasyon ni pambansang alagad ng sining para sa panitikan. Nick Joaquin There's nothing typical about Nick Joaquin when you think of most other writers out there. Si Nick ay isang writer na matatawag nating talagang napaka-complete writer. His own excellence, you know, is what you try to uh, imitate or try to emulate. He was a genuine keeper of memory. His writing was always elegant. Ang prose niya was very rich, you know. Maybe partly because of his Spanish background. Ipinanganak si Nicomides Nick Marquez Joaquin noong ikaapat ng Mayo taong 1917 sa Paco, Manila sa mag-asawang Leo Cadio Joaquin, isang abogado at veterano mula sa Himagsikang 1896 at Salome Marquez, na guro ng Ingles at Espanyol. Panglima si Nick o Onching sa sampung magkakapatid. 
Lumaki man sa pribilehyo, siya ay tahimik, mahiyain at madasaling bata. Dahil sa impluensya ng ama't ina, kinalakihan ni Nick at ang kanyang mga kapatid ang mundo ng musika at literatura. Bata pa lamang, mahilig na magbasa at magsulat si Nick. Pula-tula, kasaysayan, hanggang Biblia ay nabasa ni Nick. Dahil sa hilig sa pagbabasa, kinunan siya ng kanyang ama ng tarheta sa pambansang aklatan kung saan maghapon nagbabasa ng sari-saring libro si Nick. He started reading when he was young and his highlight of childhood was getting his card for the National Library. He had his own. Nagbago ang takbo ng buhay ng kanilang pamilya nang mamatay ang kanilang ama. Tatlong taon siyang nag-aral sa Mapa High School nang nagdesisyon siyang tumigil sa formal na pag-aaral. Pakiramdam niya ay nasa labas ng silid aralan ang hinahanap niyang mga kaalaman. Namatay ng maaga yung kanilang ama na abogado. Kaya mga high school pa lang sila, uh, nagtrabaho na siya. Hindi man siya nakatapos ng high school, hindi man siya nakatapos ng college. People like Nick Botin, hindi naman nag-workshop niya. Uh, wala namang PhD ang mga yan. In fact, wala namang degree si, si Nick Botin. Apart from his associate in arts. He and I never attended workshop. He wasn't a believer of formal education, at least for himself. He felt he would learn more if he were outside. But they were consummate readers and writers. Maraming marami siyang libro. So ito bali ang naging guro niya, hindi mga tao. Sa kanyang kabataan, pumasok si Nick sa isang panaderya sa Pasay bago siya nagtrabaho sa Tribune kung saan nagsimula ang habang buhay niyang asosasyon sa mundo ng paglalathala at panitikan. Ayon kay Nick, si Ginoong Serafin Lanot ang nakadiskubre sa kanya bilang manunulat. Taong 1934, unang nailathala ang tulang ginawa ni Nick Joaquin sa dyaryo ng Tribune kung saan siya ay nagtatrabaho nang siya ay labing pitong gulang pa lamang. Actually, hindi sila nag-meet kasi nga tumakbo na yun. Pagkatakbo niya, wala na magawa si Papa. Until nga, nung nag-submit ako ng tula sa Free Press, kasi literary editor din siya. Nagkita niyo yung pangalan ko, sabi niya, How are you related to Serafin Lanot? He's my father, sabi ko. Sabi niya, Okay, darling, I'll wait for me. I'll take you home so, te- so I can uh, see my old friend again. Patuloy sa pagsusulat at pagpapasa ng kanyang mga trabaho sa iba't ibang dyaryo, si Nick Joaquin. Dito unti-unting nakilala ang kanyang galing sa mga nalalathalang gawa gaya ng Three Generations, taong 1944 sa Herald Midweek Magazine. Habang ang ilan sa kanyang mga obra ay nagwagi sa iba't ibang patimpalak tulad ng Summer Solstice, taong 1945 sa Philippine Free Press at Guardia de Honor, taong 1949 sa parehong lathalaan. Ginawaran din siya ng Universidad ng Santo Tomas ng Associate in Art Certificate. Ang kanyang sanaysay na La Naval de Manila naman ay nagwagi sa isang patimpalak na pinangunahan ng mga Dominikano at nagbigay sa kanya na scholarship sa St. Albert College, isang monasteryong pinapatakbo ng parehong relihiyosong orden. There was a contest and he won in that contest. He wrote La Naval de Manila Biglang the Dominican saw, wow, this is beautiful, no, what he had written because it's historical. So, La Naval came as um, a turning point in his life also because it won um, a recognition and that recognition led to him getting a grant from the UST. He went to Hong Kong eh, and uh, studied at the Dominican monastery there. Then he came back. That, I believe, is when he realized he could have stayed on in the seminary. He wanted to write so much more. By being in the priesthood, it would have curtailed his writing. Taong 1950, bumalik si Nick Joaquin sa Pilipinas mula sa Hong Kong. Sa kanyang pagbabalik, ipinagpatuloy niya ang pagsusulat at pag-aambag ng kanyang mga likhang tula at kwento sa mga dyaryo at magasin. Dito, patuloy siyang nananalo sa iba't ibang pambansang patimpalak para sa panitikan. Pumasok siya bilang proofreader sa Philippine Free Press at kinalaunan ay naging manunulat sa nasabing periodiko. 
tagasuri ng pelikula, assistant editor, hanggang siya ay maging literary editor. Ang Nick Joaquin, ginagamit niya sa pagsusulat ng kwento, tula, ang Quijano de Manila sa pagsusulat ng periodismo. Pagising niyan, magsisimba yan. Tapos, pagdating, mag-aalmusal, magbabasa ng dyaryo. Pagkatapos, ang kumpisa na siya na magsulat. Habang nagsusulat siya, may beer siya sa tabi. Kahit na anong lasing niyan sa gabi, kinabukasan, maagang gigising niya, susulatin. Magsusulat siya, handwritten. Tatanghalian yan, tapos matutulog yan tanghali. Mga alas tres, gigising na yan, pupunta yan sa opisina. At sa kanya, itatype yung kanyang article na sinulat sa kamay. So, siya yung hindi diretso sa makinilya magsulat. Tsaka dalawang daliri lang yan, pero mabilis. Tapos, after that, he also liked the socialization. Sa gabi, uh, gustong-gusto niyan mamamasyal, makikinig ng tugtugin, mga music na gusto niya, uh, kasama na yung mga kaibigan. I don't know how we used to do it, kasi wala pang texting nun eh. Ewan ko kung paano kami nagko-communicate, magkakaalamanan yan. Oy, nagyayaya si Nick, inuman daw. Mahabang-mahabang mesa. Siya yung sagot niya, yung mga beer ng mga tao doon. Na walang katapusan niya kanyang pag-iinom mula umaga hanggang gabi. Padrino siya. Kasi siya yung babayad sa lahat ng iinumin niyo eh. Uh, kung saan sa kami dinadala niya. Eh. Oo nga at sabihin mo ng lasing ko siya. Although hindi mo na marat maralaman kung talagang lasing siya o nagkukunwaring lasing lang. At some point, pinapagilid ng kami lagi. Tamad daw kami. Kasi bakit daw inom kami ng inom lang? Siya rin, ganun eh. <laughs> Kasama namin siya. So you would think na parang lasing siya. But he never got drunk. He never, never got drunk. He would remember what he hears and also what he says. May ilig siyang kumanta. May isa nga siyang paboritong kanta no, na... He managed to work in all his literary friends in the, in the lyrics of that song. Binigyan niya ng sarili niyang lyrics siya. You're the top. You're my young volcano. You're the top. You're Virgin Maria. You're the sub and side of Caballos Violin. You're the Chon de Leche. You're Escabeche. You're Nick Joaquin. Tapos tataas niya ng kanya niya. Tapos yung kanyang tanyang niya. Lalo niya sinisinahan niya ganun. Pag uwi na siya, if I cannot bring him home, well, I will get the taxi in front, you know, sir. Sasabihin ko sa taxi driver, Uy, sabi ko, pag-ingatan mo yan, ah, yaman ng bayan yan, ah, sinikwakin yan. The driver usually doesn't know naman. <laughs> pag meron siyang deadline, kahit na anong oras pa siya umuwi na itong nakalipas na araw o gabi, nandun sa kanilang mesa ang kanilang manuskrito, tapos. Sa paglao ng panahon, Lumago ang karera ni Nick Joaquin sa mundo ng panitikan at periodismo. Itinuturing siyang bilang isa sa pinakamahahalagang manunulat na Filipino mula sa tula, nobela, dula, maikling kwento, hanggang sa mga sanaysay at talambuhay. Na nagsusulat din siya ng mga libro para sa mga bata halimbawa. Ano? At bihirang-bihira yan sa mga, sa mga batikang manunulat natin. Binaging niya ang pansin, yung pangailangan para sa mga kabataan natin na makapagbasa ng ng bago at exciting na, na material. My favorite piece of work by Nick Wokin is still the one that struck me between the eyes when I read it. That was his poem, Innocence of Solomon. Ito yung kanyang unang tula na nilimbag no 1938 yata. Shiba, Shiba, close your eyes. The apes defile the ivory temple. The peacocks chant dark blasphemies, but I take your body from mine to crumple. Nahanap ko ang mismong kopya nito sa Sunday Tribune magazine. Ipinakita ko sa kanya yun. Tuwan-tuwa ako. Sabi ko, Mr. Joaquin, this was your first published poem. At biro niya sa akin, ako, huwag maipakita sa akin yan. Baka hindi na bumalik sa yan. Pinakakakilala sa lahat ng mga sinulat niya, yung portrait of the artist as a Filipino. Kasi pagsulat ni Nick Joaquin, dalawang level parati eh. Meron storya na tukol sa isang pamilya, pero meron ding mas malalim na kahulugan yung storya na tungkol sa ating bansa. I was asked by uh, Cecil Guidotto Alvarez, who was then initiating PETA. No? She commissioned me and uh, a writer friend from UP, Franklin uh, Osorio, to translate yung portrait of the artist ni Nick into Tagalog. So it was the first production of what became known as Larawan 
in, in Filipino. Uh, this gave me my own uh, way of doing portrait sa larangan naman ng uh, teatro dun mismo sa Intramuros sa Fort Santiago. And it had a marvelous run for, for a, more than a year. Uh, it also featured mga artista. Tonto Arin Sinek, and he was there every night, almost every night. That was very memorable because the main, parang the climactic scene, which features a, a procession na being overlooked from the, from the Malasigan house. No? Of course, the proscenium, hindi mo ma-feature yan, parang tinitignan lang nila. Dito, nagawa. Uh, dahil may rampart, so meron talaga kaming procession. Kasali, gabi-gabi si Nick. Masiglang magsigla kasi siyempre meron muna siyang toma ng beer bago umakyat. There's another important essay he wrote, which is often quoted, entitled, um, The Heritage of Smallness. Ang dami rin galit sa kanya dyan. Parang pinapalabas niya, ang Pilipino, you know, may tingi mentality. Totoo naman eh, at that time, even up to now. I tried to teach him, and I also learned from him, like for instance, yung, the heritage of his smallness. Because for all his brilliance, Nick had very little knowledge of social anthropology. Ipinamalas ni Nick Joaquin ang tunay na kahusayan ng Filipinong henyo. Ang natatanging paraan niya sa paggamit ng wikang Ingles ay binansagang Joaquinesque o Joaquineskeri. Bukod dito, binigyan niya ng panibagong anyo at buhay ang stilo ng Filipinong periodismo na niyakap at tinangkilik ng kanyang mga mambabasa. He got used to the English language. He really hasn't read it. As far as I know, he hasn't written anything in Filipino, but it's Joaquin is curry because the subject matter is Filipino. Pag nagsulat siya ng prosa sa Ingles, talagang ang makukuli mo dyan ay yung mga tunog ng Kastila. Pagka makulay, mabulaklak, hindi naman uh, nakakauyam. Pero talagang napakapuno at komplikado lang ng kanyang description ng mga eksena na lumabas sa free press bilang Kayano de Manila. Makikita mo dito na kontroladong kontrolado yung pace ng kanyang pagre-report. Makikita mo yung biglang nagiging restrained and, and dramatic in its own way. Yung tinatawag na yung literary journalism, noong time na yun, hindi, hindi na naman, walang, wala namang ganung term, pero nagkaroon ng ganun tayong creative non-fiction o kaya literary journalism, siya'y bali yung isa sa mga nag-impisa ng ganun na gumagamit ng literary methods sa pagre-report. Umani ng iba't ibang pagkilala, parangal at gawad si pambansang alagad ng sining, Nick Joaquin. Joaquin na pick up din ng Penguin Books. Hindi lang tayo ang mga readers niya, hindi lang mga Pilipino ang makaka-appreciate sa kanya, kundi yung international mga readers. Even New York Times has already reviewed him. Ang pagsusulat ni Nick uh, transcends time. Hindi naman siya nagsusulat para sumunod sa panahon. May, meron siyang sariling panahon. Ibinigay siya ng, ng parangal na maging national artist. Nung una, his first reaction was no way. Dahil um, meron siyang mga kaibigan na mga uh, nasa arts din na nakulong. Una na si nga si Pete Lacaba. And then that idea came out na it was one way he could save Pete Lacaba out of prison. Late, ang kwento niya sa akin, ang advice daw sa kanya, Tanggapin mo na muna ang award. Sa awarding, makikita mo si Marcos o si Enrile, tsaka mo ilapit. So pumayag siya daw sa ganong kondisyon na. Nung mismong awarding night, kinausap niya si Enrile. 
Narinig sila ni Marcos. Sabi daw ni Marcos sa kanya, Okay, Nick, this release will be part of your price. The following day, na-release na ako. So ito yung kanyang advokasya na dapat merong free voice, free press, at dapat i ano yan, ilabas yan. One of the things he did as a national artist, he was able to get his medallion. What he did was he gave it to La Naval. It is now in Santo Domingo. Ang mayamang panitikan ni Pambansang Alagad ng Sining ni Joaquin ay di lamang sumasalamin sa nakaraan ng Pilipinas. Ang mga ito ay nagpapakita din ng malalim at mahalagang kabatiran ng isang henyong manunulat sa kasaysayan at kamalayan ng kanyang bayan. His book on history, A Question of Her Heroes, Meron siyang series na ginawang articles about heroes, mga national heroes ng Pilipinas. I think that this is, insofar as his journalism is concerned, I think that this is best. We agreed on Rizal. We disagreed on Spain. Ayan. Kasi Nick was a Hispanophile. And everything that we have that is good came from Spain. I disagree. As a matter of fact, I would always argument by, by saying, Nick, never forget the Spaniards killed Rizal. He had these views on Filipino nationalism that other writers never had. Malalim ang kanyang thinking, malalim din ang kanyang nationalism. Ang legacy ang ipinamana ng pambansang alagad ng sining ni Joaquin ay tunay na kayamanang panitikan ng lahing kayo manggi. Kayamanan ng kulturang Pilipino. I really miss him the most. Nung namatay siya, I really cried. Like I said, wala kong makausap the way you know, I had long talks with me. I'm nakakayak kung naalala ko how happy we used to be when we were young. Sinisikap ko pa rin naman, Nick, na ano, sundin yung mga, <laughs> yung ehemplo mo na Pagsulat hanggat kakayanin at discipline and industry and consistency as a, as a writer. And that, I think, is, is Nick Bokin's best uh, legacy to, to younger Filipino writers to keep producing that kind of art throughout your life. I wish the future generations look more into our culture, our history, our arts, because that's who we are. And I think we can learn so much from him. Well, hopefully, 50, 100, 1,000 years from now, Nick Joaquin will live. Nick Joaquin. Dakilang pambansang alagad ng sining para sa panitikan. Sa gisag kultura ng Pilipinas. Ako ay Pilipino, lahing matapang, lahing matalino, nalakbay ko ng mundo. Walang unos o bagyo sa aki gugupo, lahi ng matatag. Ako ay Pilipino. Ako ay Pilipino. Ako ay mga Diyos. Ako ay Pilipino. Ako ay mga katao, saan man magkarating, sino man makapiling. Aangat ang galing habang buhay, Pilipino. Ito 
Magsanda ang mga isla Magkakahiwalay ngunit at kakaisa Tahanan ng aming lahi Mga puok na aming nilimitki Puno ng kasaysayan Puno ng iwaga Sa mga lugar na ito nakatanim Ang ugat ng pagka-Pilipino From the simplest to the rarest of materials, from the barks and fibers of plants to the densest of hardwood, from paper and clay and precious metals to that most wondrous substance, a mind in flight, expressing itself in a torrent of words. These are the materials from which our traditional artisans and craftsmen have built solid and grounded traditions. Fragments of a nation waiting to be made whole by men and women who bring an entire culture and knowledge system into their creations. These are the chosen materials of indigenous craftsmen. They who are the embodiment of Dayao, our knowledge, Welcome to the third season of Dayao. In the next six episodes, we will unfurl textiles, caress the surfaces of wood and stone, relish gold and ivory. We will watch as beautiful objects are made from fibers, metal, clay, and paper. We will meet the minds that make of all these materials the expressions of a culture. I have always taken a very keen interest in weaving and in our weavers. In supporting our indigenous weavers, I support the community of Filipinas who are vessels of an ancient yet dynamic knowledge. Knowledge that is made new every time warp and weft are laid out to create a textile. In this season's first two episodes, we hold up to the light the expressive fibers of distinct cultures as well as the strength and resilience of the weavers who make these into a tapestry of life. Professor Norma Respicio has spent much of her life and career studying the weaving traditions in the Philippines and Southeast Asia. Her book, Journey of a Thousand Shuttles, The Philippine Weave, is a comprehensive guide to the history, the fibers, the dyes, and the techniques that make Philippine weaving a tradition with many variations, many faces, many unique manifestations. Traditions, we would say, uh, are just indicated by uh, the presence of uh, spindle whorls in the Philippines. No? Uh, these were unearthed in Cagayan, uh, and these were dated uh, 2600 to 2100 BC. When it comes to technique, it's possible that this must have been just uh, plain weaving techniques, no? but uh, when we talk about uh, material evidence of uh, a finished textile in the Philippines, we would refer to the banton cloth. No? This uh, banton cloth uh, or pieces of this are uh, made of uh, linen. No? When we say linen, this come from the bust fibers. No? That would include probably uh, even uh, banana fibers because uh, or the sheath of the banana fibers can be considered as linen. No? So uh, in that Banton cloth, we say Banton because it, uh, these were found in an island known as Banton of Romblon. No? 
and uh, these are dated 14th to 15th centuries. No? Those would be the uh, material evidences of early practice in the Philippines. No? But uh, for Southeast Asia, there are lots of weaving traditions. Threads are laid out to form a matrix of warp and weft. Though we like to think that it is the hands of the weaver that creates a textile, the weight of her body and the pressure from the lower back as it pulls against the threads is a vital part of the technology. Thus the name backstrap loom. There are two important wooden uh, bars. No? The one that is uh, pressed close to the, to the weaver's body, that one is the cloth beam. And that's where you have the rolled in there would be uh, the woven cloth, no? the woven part of the textile. At the other end no? would be uh, another bar. This time it's not split into two, but just a wooden bar of the same thickness as the one here close to the body of the weaver. And it's uh, parang nakahang siya na ganun. One characteristic of backstrap weaving is that to open and close the warp, it's the torso of the weaver that moves. When the torso of the weaver moves forward, naluluusen up yung warp. So it's easier for the heddles to be raised and for the weaver to insert the beater. And then, pagka once inserted, push back yung torso niya, and therefore, tamang tamarin naman for beating in the web. Shared by many indigenous peoples in Southeast Asia. The backstrap loom is a source of many iconic textiles. Groups that make use and have mastered this and have come up with really uh, exquisite textiles using simply backstrap would be all over Cordillera, the Ifugaos, the Bontok, the Kankanay, the Gadang, and even uh, the Kalinga. Though it may look simple and even primitive, the range of designs produced from this loom by so many weavers from all over the world is proof of its universal appeal. A shared technology that binds many weavers from many different cultures all over the world, just as it binds the weavers of the Cordillera. Mayroon talagang close similarity in terms of the use of some kind of ground weave, yung earring bone uh, design, or sometimes like uh, uh, parang diamond forms. You could see that in special cloths of the Kalinga, mainly for the upper class, and then also for special cloth for the Gadang. They are so fond of uh, coming up with that ground weave na parang diamond forms na thickly woven. In that sense, there is a similarity. And then also, some in the upper Kalinga region, the color scheme would be uh, similar to the color scheme of the Gadang. Red, white, a little bit of yellow. Aside from the all-over pattern and the ground weave, another characteristic textile of the Kalinga would be uh, that of lower Kalinga area, like in Lubwagan. Yung kanila, it's, they have green, no? red, green, and yellow for the wrap-around skirt. Instead of weaving, they do the embroidery using thick yarn to come up with mountains and river design. One characteristic of Gadang weave, which is only seen among the Gadang, the use of tiny white beads. These are all put together just like a bundle or a bunch. And then these are meant to decorate the end part of their edges of the belt or uh, seam of their uh, blouse or their uh, shirt because both men and women use uh, upper garments, barawasi for the women and cotton for the men. No? They wear upper garments and on the um, edge of these upper garments, there would be several tiny beads attached to those hem and edges of the upper garment. They also use parang red, and yellow, tiny pom-poms, no? 
attached to their woven garments. Those would be the uh, characteristic features of gadang, which cannot be seen in other Cordillera cultures. There seem to be a kind of giving valuation to all these trade beads. We don't see them produced in the Philippines, some of them Mediterranean type of beads. No? So these are given so much importance in uh, gadang dressing up. The Yakan of Basilan are renowned for their dense, tightly woven fabrics, each with a different name and motif associated with each specific garment and its usage. In museums and private collections all over the world, their seputangan headcloths hold pride of place that Yakan weavers are still producing exquisite textiles today is a tribute to a resilience and skill that has withstood armed conflict and civil unrest. The Yakan weavers make sinulaman. Both the men and the women wear trousers. And the sinulaman has the greatest warp count no? all over Philippine textile weaving traditions. It has the most number of warp. In a two-inch cloth of that uh, sinulaman, there would be not just uh, 100 warp yarns, but would be 300 or 500 warp yarns. No? Such that for one foot sinulaman uh, cloth, probably one would have more than 1,000 warp yarns. So they have the finest and pinakasiksik no? na weaving. And in their sinulaman, they uh, make supplementary warp design patterns like our glass no? or what we call uh, rice mortar design and diamond form or what we call the matamata design no? or rice grain design. While the women, other than wearing trousers, they also, over the trousers, would be a wrap-around skirt, which they call the pinantupan. That wrap-around skirt exhibits uh, flower and leaf designs, na? but a little bigger than the uh, pinantupan hourglass and uh, diamond forms. Na? So, but this time, instead of warp, supplementary warp uh, design technique, it is supplementary weft design technique being used here. The most uh, beautiful of all would be their uh, saputangan, their head cloth. That one, it's done in uh, supplementary weft technique, but it's called pick-up design technique. And uh, it's closely similar to what we could call tapestry weaving. In that saputangan head cloth, there would be a central uh, design, usually uh, triangle or a square, the whole uh, composition would be symmetrical, balanced and symmetrical. Generally, this would all be geometric forms. No? Ang saputangan po, may isang mata, may limang mata, may walo po, hanggang 24 po. Ang ibig sabihin po ng mata, yung diamond. Yung ginagamit naman namin sa, para sa damit, pagalbato. Maghabi doon sa kahoy, tapos ilagay dito sa susen, ilagay dito sa sun, nagumpisa na ito bibitan, bitan ng pangalan, ito gungen, ito bayre, sisimula po maghani, pagkabus nagtapos na maghani dito, pinapasok lang dito, ah, ah, nuwa, nuwa. Si sinuaan sinuaan. Pag ubos sinuaan, magpag. Ah, pinagpagan. Design. Gawa ng pene ni. Pinenean ni. Nowadays, the Yakan weavers produce a lot of these table runners, no? Around mga two feet in uh, length and maybe uh, one foot in width, no? Sometimes uh, longer ones could be used as shawls, no? So, the design technique used there would be very similar to the design technique of the Lao people 
and the thigh. So this is something like a combination of warp float and uh, weft supplementary design. Ngayon po kasi ang ginagawa po namin, naggawa kami ng loom, pinapawib po namin sa mga ibang bata para po matuto sila at saka tinuturuan po namin sila kung paano. Tulad po ngayon, may mga pamangkin po ako dito dalawa, nagwib po sila sa akin. Ako po ang gumagawa, tapos tinuturuan po sila, sila ang nagwib. Pinatayo namin tong village para ma-maintain ma yung uh, customs and traditions ng mga kwan, lalo na sa weaving ng yakan. Halimbawa man ma makita ng iba, ma-appreciate nila yung gawain namin. Ganun po. Mapa ma-maintain, mapalagana para makita na hindi lamang dito sa Pilipinas kahit sa buong mundo na ma-appreciate nila yung ginagawa namin. The Tingyan of Abra used to weave their binakol, dinapat, and pinilian textiles on backstrap loops. But today, the weavers have shifted to the box-type loop. According to history books, the very first pedal loom, the whole thing is framed with uh, uh, hard uh, wood, no? and it is square or box-framed uh, loom. No? But the important part of that would be the treadle or the pedals. No? So instead of the body of the weaver uh, going forward and backwards to open and close the warp sheds, it would be the treadles or the pedals that would, uh, by, by pushing them up, down, and up and down, somehow there would be the opening and closing of the warp yarns. No? The weaver, as they say, would have more convenient uh, working method in the box framing. Our visit to the weavers of Peña Rubia in Abra reveals that, despite the shift in technology, the old designs are still faithfully replicated. The Tingyan of Abra are famous for their large-scale blankets. The Pinilian, Dinapat, and Binacol motifs have become almost iconic, as these have been appropriated by fashion and lifestyle designers. But it is a weaving tradition that has much to do with ritual, spiritual belief, and above all, the use of natural organic material. The revival of indigo and other natural dyes is the mission of one ethnic man and his community. Indigo powder na nagawa na po namin, pinulbos namin mula sa mga halaman po na malatayong Ilalagay po natin dito sa mainit na tubig at tutunawin po para i-ready po natin sa pagkukulay ng blue na kulay. Dapat lang kasi ito, may, uh, katamtaman lang yung init niya kasi pag pinakuloan mo yan ng pinakuloan, sige, hahalo ulit yan. Kaya uulitin mo na lagyan ng pang pa, ano sa... sa Tub, sa tubig para yung kulay aapaw, yung dumi papailalim. Ito po ay hahanguin dito sa medyo mainit na tubig at ililipat dahan-dahan po para hindi po siya bubula. Dahan-dahan din nakukunin, dahan-dahan din ilalagay na ganyan. Pagkatapos ito na po yung ano, ito hindi na, eh, hindi na po natin lalagyan ng mordan para sa pagkapit ng ano. Kasi ang indigo po, uh, kahit hindi mo siya lagyan ng pampakapit, kakapit at kakapit pa rin yan. Yung indigo, yan ang pinakamaganda po sa indigo na kulay po natin. Dahan-dahan na rin siya, ilulubog na ganyan. Pagkatapos, pigain. Kulay habang nahahangin na na siya, lang iiba na po yung kulay niya. Magiging blue siya. 
Pagkatapos ito, pahanginan muna siya. Hanggang sa magiging kulay blue lahat yan. In our weaving history, indigo, it was one of the uh, important exports to the West, to uh, Europe and even to Mexico until the later half of the 19th century. Yung production niya siguro as a commercial or a cash crop, medyo it bumaba, no? But the local weavers continued to use it, especially that somehow, as I said, parang there is a kind of value given to uh, natural deep blue hue. Parang to them, usually find women or men wearing the deep indigo. This would be people who are of a higher social class. It had a value somehow expressive of the uh, higher social status of the person wearing. In the neighboring province of Ilocos Norte, in the barangay of Lumbaan, Bikbika, in Pinili, Weaver Magdalena Gamayo continues to weave, and more importantly, teach young weavers. She has spent a good part of nine decades preserving and enriching the tradition of weaving in Abel. For her life's work, Nana Magdalena was awarded the highest distinction given to our folk artists, she was proclaimed a recipient of the Gawad Manilikanang Bayan in 2012. A weaving center and a museum housing her handiwork have since been opened to further preserve the traditions she has worked so hard to keep alive. So far, we've only explored the world of weavers who work with cotton. But what about weavers who work with other fibers, like in Aklan, in Antique, and other areas in Western Visayas, and in La Union, and parts of Region 1, and in the Cordillera? In many areas of the country, we find weavers adept at working with silk, with banana, and even with piña. We don't have any record at all how we got to uh, get those uh, silk worms, no? But it's possible that since we have very active trading uh, relations with China, and it's possible that we got the silkworms from East Asia through trade. Pinya, it is the finest of all fibers. It's really even finer than that of a strand of hair. It's very distinctly Philippine because the fiber can be gathered only from a type of pineapple, which is what the pineapple plant, which grows only in the Philippines. And in particular, this is the red Bisaya variety. The pineapple, the abaca, and cotton, no? those are the top three fibers uh, used in the Philippines. Filipino weaver uses materials coming from the natural environment. And these materials like grass, pandan leaves, thread from piña, banana fiber, Sinamay, abaka, and all of these are regarded as sacred. Why? Because they contain a spirit. We regard these things as part of our everyday life. We commune with them, and they are not just dead objects. That's why when a weaver um, tries to get inspiration from nature, the inspiration 
is from a spiritual world. Among the Thibonis, there's a belief in the spirit or a nature spirit supplying the signs to the weaver. That's why we have the concept of dream weavers. And myth is very important in this regard simply because the moment you sacralize a tradition, it means that it's a very important part of everyday life. You have to consider the weaving as a whole um, and uh, preserve the original nature of these creations as much as possible. This is how we revere the, the, the traditional weaving material that we find among our indigenous peoples, our traditional peoples. With the onset of the Industrial Revolution, well, we have now come to regard uh, traditional weaving patterns, materials, as just, uh, well, an input for contemporary design. This is the reason why many of our weavers have become simply mass producers of patterns that they repeat and repeat and repeat. With such a rich tradition and a continuing heritage of weaving expressive fibers into even more expressive textiles, how can we support our weavers? In my own capacity, I've always tried to see how the products can be viable, more marketable sources of income for the local community through cooperatives, through trade fairs and expositions where they get more exposure, through grants and financial and technical assistance that ensure that weavers get the right material, that they go on weaving, that they pass on the knowledge. For me, theirs is such a vital craft that says so much about the strength and the skill of a Filipina. And in our efforts to ensure the continuance of weaving by patronizing the work and learning more about the tradition, are we not also weaving a stronger national fabric? A fabric that contains all the beauty and inspiration that come with Dayao, our knowledge, our pride. From the simplest to the rarest of materials, from the barks and fibers of plants to the densest of hardwood, from paper and clay and precious metals to that most wondrous substance, a mind in flight, expressing itself in a torrent of words. These are the materials from which our traditional artisans and craftsmen have built solid and grounded traditions. Fragments of a nation waiting to be made whole by men and women who bring an entire culture and knowledge system into their creations. These are the chosen materials of indigenous craftsmen. They who are the embodiment of Dayao, our knowledge, Right. 
The second part of expressive fibers takes us beyond places where cotton, silk, and piña are used and into the hills of Lake Cebu, where a master weaver works abaca into stunning textiles. We also go beyond our standard ideas of weaving and fibers as we explore baskets, palaspas, and the underappreciated jewel of our weaving tradition, the Banig of Pasilan, Palawan, and Samar. Weaving fibers, from cotton to pandan, from silk to nito, into textiles, baskets, mats, and utensils. It may seem complex and confusing to modern-day Filipinos, but for others, like the Tiboli weaver Barbara Ofong and other weavers we feature here, weaving is second nature, a means of expressing identity and celebrating life itself. Like the deceased Gawad Manilika ng Bayan awardee Lang Dulay, Barbara Ofung is a Tiboli weaver who has mastered the difficult art of weaving abaca ikat. It is difficult, first, because abaca fiber is more laborious to process and to prepare than cotton. And because ikat weaving demands a technical precision where the abaca threads are tied and then dyed before being laid out on the backstrap loom. Only when the dyed threads are laid out on the backstrap loom does a semblance of a design emerge. And only when the weaving process has been completed will stunning and integral textiles emerge. Designs and motifs all from the dreams and imagination of the weaver passed on from generation to generation. Abaca can also be considered like linen. Because when we say linen, it's actually fibers coming from the stem. So since the fibers of the abaca come from the sheath of the fibrous banana, then that can also be linen. Suitable for textile weaving because it abounds in, well, the plant itself abounds in the Philippine Islands, from Mindanao, Visayas, even Luzon, but even Tagalog, Southern Tagalog area. There have been production of abaca textiles. The term ikat is actually uh, a Bahasa Indonesia term, which of course uh, also being used uh, by Malaysia. And now it's the uh, term uh, uh, used all over the world, in textile world, when we talk about uh, tie-dye resist. Ikat is tie-dye resist uh, uh, design technique. Most of the Mindanao cultures in the Philippines use uh, ikat as the design technique. The Mandayas, they do their designs under dagmais using the ikat uh, technique. Then also Bagobo for their uh, uh, inabal, the Blaan for their inabor and their then the Tiboli for their tinalak. In reality, talaga, no, ikat seem to be uh, uh, practiced no? by uh, almost all cultures from north to south. For the Tiboli and the Bagobo and also the Blaan, they uh, usually come up with the uh, abaca ikat textiles that are of smooth uh, texture very pliant, smooth texture, well-defined uh, forms, no? uh, design forms, meaning, meaning uh, the colors, it's not crooked or not, not uh, spilling out of the design form. No? So uh, it shows that there is a uh, high skill in the tying itself and also in the dyeing. The weavers or the people involved in the production of this Abaca textiles no, have really mastered no, the dyeing process itself, the tying and dyeing, plus the whole process of textile weaving and even the finishing. They go through all these textiles, go through finishing, except for the mandaya. No? The mandaya and also subanen, they don't, uh, the, their abaca textiles do not go through a uh, finishing process. For the Bagobo, Bulaan, and Tiboli, uh, the finishing process would be something like uh, uh, they would press no, the woven abaca textiles using uh, 
the back of the cowry shell. No? So that's what they would press really very hard on the surface of the woven abaca textiles to make it uh, shiny, pliant, no? and uh, every now and then they would rub a bit of the honey beeswax no? uh, or the beeswax. They would press or they would uh, apply that on the woven textiles and then uh, press <coughs> the surface of that abaca uh, ikat textile with uh, the use of the back of the cowrie shell. One thing about uh, this. Uh, master weavers, the late Salinta Monon and uh, late Lang Dulay were uh, awarded the Manlilikanang Bayan uh, honor. No? They um, are really uh, dedicated textile weavers, no? very dedicated. They never use commercial dye, they only use natural dye. For uh, Lang Dulay, for example, she is really the master of uh, designing. No? she can come up with designs that are so intricate, just like the phoenix design. How can one come up with the phoenix? Or, you know, we all know that the phoenix is a mythical bird with the intricate uh, plumes, no? Mm, depicted with intricate plumes. And that's what she produced in some of her textiles. The works of Salinta Monon and uh, Lang Dulay, Barbara Ofong, and also Hilda, also uh, Tiboli. They're really very good weavers, very smooth surface, well-defined uh, design forms, no? and uh, shiny and pliant. While the animist Tiboli used the ikat method to embellish the abaca textile, the Islamic Tausug used embroidery influenced by Chinese motifs, but thoroughly indigenized. A visual language of ochre scrolls and floral designs embroidered in silk threads on satin. This is a distinctly Tausug art of Habul Tiyahian embroidery. Perhaps we find ourselves so overwhelmed with the wealth of textile motifs and techniques in our own country that we sometimes overlook the baskets, palaspas, and the humble banig as fine examples of how expressive fibers are crafted. These are functional, yes, but they also express a high aesthetic standard. Humble, yes, dignified, of course, and always reflecting a people's sense of functional beauty. The collection of the Tawid Museum in Lawag City documents the variety of shapes and forms developed by the peoples of the Cordillera. Here are baskets for winnowing rice, for transporting seedlings and grains, baskets for storing food and vegetables. Each form and type depicts a unique response of Cordillera artisans to the needs of their community. Weaving fibers is so deeply ingrained into our culture that we often overlook the crafts that are most endearingly connected to our own lives. Perhaps because the materials and finished products are ephemeral, we often take forms like the palaspas and the banig for granted. One scholar, Elmer Nocheseda, has devoted his life to studying these forms. His two books, Palaspas and Rara, document the wealth of these ephemeral crafts, as well as the knowledge and skill of the anonymous craftsmen. I have documented more than 200 Palaspas forms from all over the Philippines, from north to south. And it involves different kinds of palm leaf art, from utilitarian to decorative. Those palaspas forms that are used for packaging rice and those palaspas forms that are used for as games, as toys, and those palaspas forms used in rituals, in dances, in prayers, in decorating altars, and in offertory rituals. Palaspas in the present form has been limited to the Palm Sunday rites that we have been used to 
But in old dictionary, in the 1613 dictionary of Tagalog by Padres Pedro San Lucar, Palaspas was given a very broad meaning. It's not only the palm that is used to to decorate the churches in the Palm Sunday rites, but it includes also all the palm leaf art that could be made out of the leaves of coconut tree, of buri, of pandan, and other leaf material. Those of us who have slept on a well-made banig remember the experience in tactile, sensual terms. The worn smoothness of the woven surface, the smell of fibers, the touch of the frayed edges. The banig is one of the few woven artifacts that most Filipinos know and respond to instinctively. The variety of maps and designs found all over the islands is a testament to its appeal. We have a very pervasive mat weaving culture in the Philippines. Almost from north to south, um, we have a mat weaving tradition. It is basically because we have plenty of natural materials that lend themselves to mat weaving. The different areas in the Philippines can boast of a particular mat based on the mat weaving material available in that area. The most common material is the pandan. The next is the buri. The basic technique is the one over one or the simple mat weave. And this is present in all the mat weaving areas in the Philippines. But some culture weaving cultures have intensive culture of mat weaving that they have created different techniques to form different designs. Like the Sama of Tawi-Tawi, they make use of the splicing technique called Tinabit. Mat weaving is a way of life. It cannot be taught in school. You have to be there in the community to learn and to understand the, the mat weaving. And mat weaving is imbibed. It's a tacit knowledge that one acquires from her grandmother, from her mother, from her aunt, from her sister, from her uh, relatives. It's passed on, tradition is passed on. And the lifestyle is acquired from getting the palm, the palm leaves, from getting the pandan leaves, by stripping them, uh, boiling them, dyeing them, drying them, weaving them, and cutting them into the right sizes. Our survey of mat weaving traditions begins in Palawan, among the Palawan. Some of the best mats are found in Palawan. When you go to the south, you could see the mats made by the Jama Mapun. And they have created beautiful mats because they have a very beautiful source of pandan leaf material. The Palawan people have access to bountiful supply of rattan. These beautiful mats are integral in the life of the people of Palawan. For the Jama Mapun, they use it as a, the mat for their prayers during Salah. So mats have meaning in the lives of the people of Palawan. Mga materials po ay pandan leaves, tapos ito ay kinukulayan, at ito ay mahaba-haba rin proseso bago mabuo itong paggawa ng banig na ito dahil ito ay papaputiin, tapos kukulayan, then gaga, gawin na yung kung anong design ang gusto o order ng mga tao, then ito po ay duble. May lining po siya, yun ang ganun. Pag ganitong maliliit na banig, ito ay uh, mga isa, limang araw hanggang pitong araw kung ang materials ay ready na para gawin. Pag malalaki naman po, mga isang buwan ang paggawa ng paggawa uh, ng banig ng nito, na tulad nitong Nito kalaki. The Yakan are renowned for their dazzling and complex textiles. The geometric motifs found in their seputangan textiles are also echoed in their bani. The Yakan weavers make use of a lot of colors, as you could see in their woven textile. And in seputangan, they use varied colors, and they apply it also in their mats. What is very nice in their mats is they make use of asymmetrical patterns. It's not typical grid-like designs that is 
predominant in most mats. And you could see this asymmetrical beauty mats of the yakan. Iyon ang nagturo sa akin. Nanay ko na ganito yung paggawa sa kanya. Iyon ang ginagawa ko yung turo ng nanay ko. O yung mga weavers sa pamilya namin. Yung mga, yung kapatid ng nanay ko, mayroon din po matuto maggawa ng banig. Tapos yung anak niya, marunong din. Kaya na ano ganito, nabuo ganito, imagine lang po. Sa isip namin lang ginukuha yun. Yung ganito kami naggawa, isip-isip namin lang yun. In Samar, the tradition of mat weaving is enriched by a unique location. In Basay, the weavers of Basyao traditionally weave their mats in the nearby cave. The mats of Samar are the most popular mats in the Philippines. When you speak of Banig, everybody thinks of the Samar mats because it's very distinct in the sense that they make use of a lot of, uh, of designs and they follow the trend of the season, of the present age, in forming designs. The caves basically are used for practical reasons. One, it shades them from the direct rays of the sun. Because the woven material, the material that is being used are very delicate and can snap when it is so dry. So they want to maintain the humidity of the place such that they would not break the fibers that they are weaving. In some areas which uh, don't have the benefit of the caves, they can just weave during the early morning hours or the late in the evening or early afternoon when the sun sets. Nung maliit pa po kami, nakikita namin po sa lola namin, sa nanay namin. Tapos, nung kain na namin, nag-uumpisa na kami mag maggawa nito ng banig. Hanggang sa ngayon po, ito po ang aming ginagawa. As folk art, the mats of the Philippines can be considered a metaphor for our similarities and our differences. Each distinct design, each technique, each particular way of weaving, dyeing, and finishing a mat speaks volumes about how the same object can be so expressive of a people's sensibility. Ang Banig ay isa sa pinakamahalagang bahagi ng kulturang Pilipino mula sa pag pagsilang niya hanggang sa kanyang kamatayan. Bahagi ito ng buhay ng Pilipino. Walang ibang bagay sa Pilipino na ganitong ka-pervasive ang binibigay na halaga sa buhay ng Pilipino. Unfortunately, yung mga nakatira na sa siyudad at na malayo na sa, sa gawa ng banig ay nakakalimutan na ang kahalagahan ng banig na ito. We cannot end our survey of the country's expressive fibers without looking at these other forms. The vakul is a distinct trademark headgear of the Ivatan of Patanes. Part raincoat, part sunshade, the tough fibers that make up the signature mane are attached to a basketry form. In the rain, the vakul keeps one's head dry. In the scorching heat, it keeps the head and back cool. Pagawa kayo ng wakol, ito ang unang gawin. Ganyan. Para mafino yung ano, legs niya. I maging far beer na. Ipapatuyo na. Ito na. Ihihiwalay na. Yung bakol, ito ang umpisa niyan. Pang 
pang babae. Ito ang umpisa sa ulo. Yung abaka, yan ang pag ano yan, ibabalot yan ang, sa abaka, yung buyaboy. Ganyan. Kung pa, ipataas mo na ito sa paganito, yan na ilagay mo na yung base nito para may ano na. Ito ang abaka. Ito ang abaka, yan ang eh, ano yan sa buyaboy. Ipaloob yung buyaboy dito sa abaka. Tapos, ipabuhol sa lubid para may teknik ang buhol nito. Igagamit ang abaka dito sa bakol para maano yung buyaboy dito sa katawan ng bakol. Para matibay. Ito ang isang bakol na ito, yung large na bakol. Isang linggo ang paggawa nito. Among the Maranao, the tutup is covering for food that is used in both ceremonial gatherings as well as ordinary meals. The dome shape is made all the more attractive by the bursts of color and the woven geometric patterns. began with textiles and clothing, then on to baskets and palaspas, banig, and headgear. Our survey is far from complete, but that only stresses just how rich and varied are the crafts that utilize our expressive fibers. The Filipino craftsman has so much respect for nature. As much as possible, the raw state of the material is preserved to make sure that we recognize where it came from. For example, the grass leaves are shown as they are, although colored, but still you recognize the materials that were used for the product. Unlike um, in other countries, in other cultures, where so much polishing, so much transformation occurs that you hardly recognize the material from which it is made. In our culture, there is also the respect for certain times of the year to harvest materials. For example, there is the idea of taga sa panahon, meaning you cut it at the right season. There's also the tendency on the part of our traditional artists to gather materials that are just lying around and also leaves that are just uh, we are being blown by the wind, twigs, they are used not only for firewood, but for materials, for the creation of art. So in general, there is a respect for nature, to preserve the natural look of the material, and also not to destroy the ecology by getting only those things that are in excess in nature. Traditional Filipinos took from nature the fibers they needed. They wrapped themselves in the weaves of their own creations. They lived with baskets and containers woven with grace and resilience. They rested, bonded, and slept on fragrant mats. 
So doing, they enhanced their lives with their own handiwork. Their communities made stronger by the shared experience of creating and living with the work of their own hands. More than just craft, it was a way of living, a lifestyle bound to the earth, to the community, to the ideals of beauty and even comfort. A life lived with Dayao, our knowledge, our pride.